Thank you for joining me. This is Katie Whitledge with the Beyond the Technique podcast. We're talking about analyze, pivot, and implement. We have first-time guests Tracy Herring and Melody Van Drunen here today. I cannot wait for you to meet them. This is going to be good for you to think about what is it in your salon that you need to analyze, make a pivot on, and then the new thing or the new approach that you're going to implement. I am really excited about this conversation because these women are next level, high standard, high performing women and business leaders. So, okay, before we bring them to the mic, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Meet Your Stylist. For those of you who are working on guest acquisition this year and you really value the way that you pair new guests with your stylist, Meet Your Stylist is the solution for you. Instead of relying on your front desk team to have behavioral economics experience or social psychology experience, that's what Meet Your Stylist is here for. Meet Your Stylist is a fun, easy, accurate matchmaking quiz that will live on your salon website and utilize throughout your salon social media. Future guests will take your quiz and get matched with their top three stylists at your salon. Here's the good news. They're actually going to book come in and you will retain them because you got that match made correctly the first time. We never get a second chance to make a a first impression. So this is pivotal for our businesses. Join the hundreds of salons using Meet Your Stylist. Go to meetyourstylist.com to learn more. Okay, well, let me just tell you here about Tracy Herring and Melody Van Drunen. They are a part of a multi-location brand in Texas, Devante Salon. Tracy is a former global learning leader for a Fortune 500 corporation. And then she took on her lifelong passion, which is growing people to be the best version of themselves. Her relentless desire to help her employees realize their hopes and dreams have deep roots in her own personal life experiences. And this manifested itself in the beauty and wellness industry. So she opened Devante Salons, which is a brand with an environmentally conscious hair salon brand in greater Dallas-Fort Worth area. Melody Van Drunen is the woman running it all. She is the director of operations for their enterprise. I think it's very cool for you to hear their story today and how Tracy hasn't worked one day in, in the three location salons. She relies on Melody to live out the vision that they have for their brand, and they work extraordinarily together. And today they're here to share how they've analyzed, made pivots, and implemented new things that have helped their brand expand, their team have success, and overall uh, an award-winning salon. They are top 200 salon in North America this year. So without further ado, help me welcome Tracy and Melody. Welcome to Beyond the Technique. Hi, thank you for having us. We're excited. I'm excited to have you. We've known each other for quite some time working together on, you know, beyond the technique, right? What do we do beyond the technical aspects of being behind the chair that help us propel our businesses? And so it's just such a thrill that we actually get to sit at the mic together and share the wonderful things that you are doing. So I'll start with Tracy. If you could just share with us, coming from corporate America, how you decided to get into the beauty industry. Okay. Thank you, Katie. We're honored to be here today. So my story is actually kind of humorous in the fact that I, um, you know, I've I've been working since I was 17 years old. You know, I, I never had a break, never had a choice except to work, but I love to work. But when I was 27... Uh, my best friend had, my hairdresser had become my best friend. Okay. We lived in a really small rural community in Texas. And I was talking to her repeatedly about how frustrated I was with my job that I had had for the, you know, past several years. So she convinced me to quit that job and to go back to cosmetology school and get my license and go into business with her. So that's the power of your hairdresser right there, that I quit the best paying job in town at that time to to do what she had suggested. So we were in business together a couple of years, and uh, through that experience, I learned to really appreciate and love the industry. But a couple of years later, 
uh, my then husband and I moved. And when we moved, I had the opportunity to just go back to school, get uh, my regular degree and, uh, and then go to work, you know, as a corporate career, but I still loved the industry. So jump forward uh, till about 11 years ago, my brother and I discovered that uh, we both were on this path to own our own businesses. And he was actually looking at one of the big box franchises that cut hair. And I told him I would go in 50-50 with him on two conditions. One, I was the majority owner. <laughs> That's the big sister in me. And second of all, that we aligned with a more luxury brand, you know, and because I knew more about the industry than he did. And so we did that. And so we launched our business uh, 11 years ago and I bought him out two years ago now. And so I'm 100% owner of the businesses. And like you said, we've grown it into uh, three locations. Wow, what a quick journey once you open location one to have three locations. At what point did you meet Melody? Because I, I think it's interesting that you've never worked in the salon ever. Right. So how do you, I mean, owners are probably thinking, I'd love to figure out how to work a couple days or not have to work a couple days, right. maybe a week. How did you pull that off? And, and at what point did you meet Melody? Okay. So a couple of things I was, it was very intentional when we were looking to purchase our first salon, we wanted a salon that was up and running. And that could, had proven that it could run without the owner operator in the business. Because a lot of salons that we looked at, if you, if you removed the owner's income and compensation out of that equation, there wasn't a lot left, you know, to, to purchase in the business. So, so we found Devante at our first location and it, it fit that model. And it actually had a manager in place that was, uh, came fairly highly recommended to us through the, the owner. And so the first few months after we bought that, I was just always, my philosophy is just sit back and let it run and learn what's going on. But I also had a pretty high profile corporate job. And so I needed somebody that would run that business for me. And I'm not joking when I say I was getting 17 phone calls a day. You know, and I'm like, wait a minute, I thought you were running this salon for me. And so uh, it was an interesting situation. I tried coaching and mentoring a little bit, but was already of the mindset that I was probably going to need to find someone else to run my businesses for me. And then um, through universal intervention, Melody showed up and interviewed with us as an esthetician role. Okay. And so I initially hired her uh, to come to work for us as an esthetician. And after about a month in our business, I was up there uh, checking on the business one day and she asked me if she could have a private conversation with me. And uh, we are an Aveda branded salon and she had come with a robust background with Aveda. And so the private conversation we wanted to have with me, is she asked me, she said, Tracy, you may have the brand on your sign, you have the products on the shelf, but you are not an Aveda salon. And see, I had bought an Aveda salon intentionally. So my question was for her to tell me more about what she meant. And by the time we got through a couple of conversations on that, I offered her my manager position. Well, now that I know Melody, I know she is bold and driven. Melody, share with us just a bit about your industry journey and how you felt drawn to Devante, but greater than just providing aesthetics, you know, how you were like this born leader and really was bold enough to share your input with um, Tracy. Well, yes, I'm happy to, I, you know, I think if my mom could be here right now, she would have told you all along that, you know, Melody is Miss Bossy Pants, you know, was kind of deep rooted in my veins for sure. But listen, I started my, I my worked my entire career uh, for the past 17 years. Uh, this is my 18th year in the beauty industry. Um, you know, I started 
you know, with a big brand uh, as a makeup artist and helping to push sales, uh, you know, at the very beginning. And then, uh, you know, really discovered, you know, my passion for um, people and, you know, kind of providing solutions, whatever that meant. And uh, I found my way to working in a salon um, in the Dallas area. And, you know, I, I started as guest services. And so I started, you know, kind of front of the house and, and really adopted a passion for, um, you know, guest care and um, creating experiences for guests. And then um, luckily through that salon, you know, I was offered a, a spa room where I, I grew a business as an esthetician and, uh, you know, they were, uh, you know, took really, really good care of me as well and letting me kind of explore what was next for me. And so I, I started um, being able to teach product knowledge classes and, and helping to, you know, onboard new hires and, and really, really discovered a passion for really, for sharing uh, best practices, you know, things that would help other people grow. And um, I, I got lucky in the next phase of my career, the Veda Institute opened up in Dallas, and I was able to get a position with them uh, teaching in aesthetics and uh, growing more and more, you know, from the very beginning, people coming into the industry, um, I felt like I had a, a chance to influence um, the next generation of salon uh, professionals, and especially in the spa, where we know that that's a super hard uh, domain to grow within, especially right out of school. And so I, I was really, really happy there. And um, but at the same time, I, I was driving a little over an hour uh, to get to work every day and an over an hour to get home every day. And uh, lo and behold, my hometown uh, where I had, you know, kind of replanted myself and was start deciding to grow my family there. I, I found out there was an Aveda salon in my backyard the whole time. And um, so I walked in and, you know, met Tracy and Randy and, and asked for a job as an esthetician. And then and, you know, as the, the story that Tracy told, I, I, I saw a lot of opportunity. I knew what was available to them that they, you know, maybe didn't know or weren't taking advantage of at the time. And um, I knew that I, I had an opportunity to share that with them so that, that their business could be even more successful. And that was what it was about. It wasn't about, you know, one manager not doing things that she could have been doing. It was really just um, helping to present, you know, what, what our options were. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm super lucky to have met Tracy at that moment in time. I think that our relationship now is, is one of mutual respect and growth. And, um, I, I am incredibly thankful for the opportunity to, um, explore my ideas and what she, you know, the, the opportunity that she gives me to try new things. Um, you know, some, I like to say most of them work, not all of them do, but, you know, we learn as we go and um, it's, it's been great. And we've been able to grow the brand, um, you know, the Devonti brand across multiple locations now. And, and people are, are seeking us out for, um, you know, education and opportunity and, and, and market research, whatever it is. And uh, we're happy to do it. And we have, we have a lot more work to do and a lot more growth to conquer. So. I love your mindset on that. And that should always be the mindset, right? Like always getting better. Um, oh. And you really have this cool, this is one of many reasons that you were recognized as a top 200 salon in North America. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, but that you really take time to analyze your business, the different areas of your business. And when you know you need to pivot, you do it and you implement something new. So Tracy, tell me what's something this year that you took a look at it, you made a pivot and you implemented something new. Okay. So, um, during COVID, you know, when we were having to work, we were closed and then we had to work a reduced schedule. And then we had only 50% occupancy in our businesses. I decided as a business owner, you know, we know in this industry, all we have is our people, right? And so I decided as a business owner to invest pretty heavily in my team because I wanted to retain every single one of them. I was hearing all of these horror stories about salons having, you know, stylists that just decided to get out of the industry, you know, salons, you know, closing their doors because of COVID. 
So what I decided to do during that period of time, which was the majority of last year, is I kept my employees whole on their salaries. Okay, so even though we were working at a 50% reduction in capacity, which meant a 50% reduction about, you know, in sales, I kept them at the same level of salary that they were pre-COVID. Okay, wow. we were able to retain them all. That was great. But I, you know, soon realized after we were able to reopen and get back to normal operations that that was uh, not a sustainable thing you know, to do, I needed to move, we're a commission-based salon, and I needed to move everybody back to commission, again, while still retaining them, right, yeah. and so we, that was our first thing, we said, we need to look at our compensation model, but that, when we started looking at that compensation model, we discovered that we needed to go all the way back to our P&L, you know, what was our P&L? What were the expenses that we had? And we looked at every single thing from our expenses to our um, compensation model, of course, but to our pricing structure, did a very detailed market analysis of where we were pricing our services as compared to our market and uh, found out we had a lot of opportunity there. So we did this whole scale uh, pricing increase, compensation, uh, review and improvement, I will say, nobody felt like that they were losing one thing when we got through with this. And, uh, and no customers, I don't even know that we had one Melody that said anything about our price increase. It was just the right time and I think we managed it uh, very well. Uh, part of my background is uh, change management and change communication. So we put together a pretty robust change management approach to make sure everybody had bought into the change. They were aware of it. They knew exactly what was coming and when it was coming. And then that we were able to implement that and hold our mid-level managers accountable for the performance that came with those, those new compensation structure. Wow, that's huge. I mean, I'm Everybody listening is probably like, what does it mean for change management? How do you kind of control an outcome? What are maybe a couple tips that you could give listeners on how to effectively, because change is huge. And I know a lot of salons are doing a lot of things different with their pricing model or services right. model, but compensation's mm -hmm. touchy going yeah. from one thing to another. So how, what are some, a couple tips for change management that you could share? Well, you know, I think the best thing to do is ask everybody, you know, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to them is when a change came and happened and they didn't know about it, right? And so the, the worst model is, is to send an email or create a little video and put that out there telling everybody what's going to change and assume that that's change management, okay? Mm -hmm. That is usually just your first step, which is awareness, okay? Mm -hmm. Making people aware, all right? But that is only the first thing. The second thing you have to do is create a desire within the people that are being impacted by the change. So it's the why, right? So why do you want them? Why should they? What's in it for me? We've all heard of that, right? With them, what's in it for me? So you have to create that desire. And then you have to make sure that they know how to implement the change along with you. You know, if you've got a new pricing structure, well, what is their pricing structure? You've got some new benefits, what are those? And how do I use those? How do I apply those in my work? So you give them the knowledge to, to do that. And then you have, like I said, there's an accountability uh, approach that you have to put accountability measures in place to make sure everybody's, you know, doing the change activities that you need them to do. And then there's just the reinforcement, you know, over time. And um, it's those last two, you know, the accountability and the reinforcement that will uh, get you every time. Uh, Melody, uh, you know, sometimes I'll go in there and I'll say, hey, Melody, you know, I thought, you know, last year we decided to do X, Y, Z. When did we decide just to quit doing that? And more likely than not, it's just something that fizzled away because we didn't have accountability and reinforcement of those behaviors that we needed to have. Wow. So those are really big changes. Melody, from your perspective, being more on the front lines, you are the one to hold everybody accountable 
and focusing on the reinforcement. Tell us how pivoting and implementing went for you. What did that look like from your perspective? Well, yeah, I had my hands definitely in every single step. And so when it came time to decide what it is that needed to be changed, you know, I was the one that was sitting down and we were, we really were, we were doing a comprehensive analysis of where we are today versus where, uh, what are all the possibilities? You know, it's never just one option. There's probably several. And so we had to kind of play out, how do we get from where we are today to where that thing is or where that thing is. And, um, you know, it definitely was a couple of different options for us. You know, we had originally been doing time-based pricing and, you know, was that going to continue? Is that something that we wanted, um, that we saw, uh, was able to be scaled up in a, in a pricing change and, or was it not, was it time to go back to a service-based, um, model? And, you know, so that was, that was intensive, right? Like this took before we even got to this change management portion of it, you know, there was so much time that was dedicated to figuring out what is the change even going to be, you know what I mean? And so it, it was, um, was that analysis phase? Really yeah. the analysis phase months. was, months. was months. Yeah. It was me, you know, figuring out, yeah, what are the other salons in my area doing, but what are the other beta salons? Cause we know that that's a point of difference for our customers. And so looking at all of that, and then I'm um, deciding what it was that needed to be changed. And as Tracy mentioned, you know, it was several things. It was this whole compensation package. It wasn't just how they, it wasn't just a price increase, you know? And, and so and um, when it came down to um, having that conversation, you know, in that time to pivot, right? We've, we've moved from analysis into, okay, it's time to make the change. Um, we were very, very conscious about um, how we shared that with our team. Uh, we decided to do intentional drips you know, of information into the um, break room. So, you know, maybe it was somebody sharing, one of our leaders sharing a little slice of the pie, you know, and to see how did people react and respond to that? You know, what were some of the things that they may not um, tell us in a team meeting? What is the break room chatter around that change? And it, it really did. It impacted um, how we structured um, announcing the change so that we could address some of those things that came up in the break room um, conversation. And um, when it came time to introduce, we customized a compensation package for every single employee. And so um, that was unique to them. It had you know, their picture on it. It had their name on it. It had their numbers on it. Um, and it, it took a lot of time, but it was absolutely well worth it. And, you know, I carved out um, dedicated time, uninterrupted time, a minimum of an hour to sit down and walk through literally every single change um, and all the things that were going to stay the same. We wanted to make sure that not every single thing that they were used to at Defonte was going to be changing. Some of those things were going to stay the same and that was going to bring comfort to them. And um, it was it was awesome. The response that we got to it were was was really great questions. You know, they were really, really thinking dynamically about the changes and they were thinking outside of themselves, which was kind of um, something cool that I didn't expect to come out of it, that they were um, they had felt so taken care of during um, our pandemic experience that they were really, um, wanting to make sure that it was the right thing for Devonte, which I thought was super cool. And so they, um, they, they asked some really cool questions. Um, like I said, we were able to customize it to them. And then what uh, was able to come out of it was people who knew exactly what was going on. There were very few questions. Um, they knew exactly where to find every resource. Um, and we were able to implement the change. And like Tracy said, we got practically zero, 0. 0.0001, you know, kickback from the price increase. People expected it. People are still expecting it. And let's be honest, we could all probably do a secondary price increase at this time. Uh, it would be right for our business and the guests would can 100% understand. Um, but it's just all about doing it the right way couple um, questions for you. Yeah. So did you change from time-based pricing to expertise? 
We did. So we've always been tiered, right? We've always had our levels within um, the business, but we, we were uh, time-based pricing and I found it in, incredibly difficult to scale the right way for our market. Um, it just kind of put us a little bit, we needed to find a happy medium between where we were and a super high price point. So we did ultimately go back to service-based pricing. And then did you stick with commission for your compensation? Absolutely. We scaled it though. Yeah. We, it, we, yeah. we, um, part of, part of this was, um, inter- figuring out not only are we going to increase pricing, but we want to figure out a way to increase benefits. Um, so that it looked like, um, uh, paid time off and all of that. And so in order to do that, we took a look at, and everybody who was currently part of our business was grandfathered into where they were, if it was, you know, um, changing and it, it downwards. Um, but yeah, all new hires are kind of coming in. It's more of a scaled, you know, we never exceed the benchmark for, um, uh, provider price or payroll. Um, so, uh, but doing that allowed us to have resources to be able to offer things like paid time off and other benefits like that. Yeah. So what I had discovered as the owner, Katie, is that I had, I, I love the concept of keeping it simple but I, have over, I had oversimplified things. So we had one commission rate, you know, after you got to out of our fresh talent training program and you got on the floor and you became a commission stylist, everybody was paid the same commission, okay? So we realized that that was kind of crazy because it would take a master stylist like five or six years to even, you know, get a pay increase that was worthy of calling a pay increase because they were, it was only dependent on prices going up, right? Or them doing more, more services. So we did, like Melody said, implement that scaled uh, commission rate. But we, but we also, along with that commission rate, another benefit is I still guarantee them a minimum hourly rate. Now, it's not anywhere near what their commission rate would be because we want to encourage everybody to, you know, make those numbers for their commission. But, you know, we have a week where, you know, God forbid they had, you know, just a bunch of cancellations or people moved their appointments that, that, that they still get, they can count on a minimum base salary uh, for me every, every paycheck. Awesome. And to not have massive pushback on either the guest side or the team side means that your execution was flaw- preparation and execution were, were really on point. Um, are there any new things that are coming up in 2022 that you still have a desire to analyze, pivot, and possibly implement? I think the reality of it is that I'm always doing it. Mm -hmm. I am constantly, I'm hungry for research. I'm hungry for innovation. And so the, you know, kind of what I do and what Tracy and I do, and we set this out strategy and we hand that down to our leaders to you know, execute, you know, on a quarterly basis that allows us time to see, okay, well, what's next? What's not working the way that we want it to, or it's not delivering us the results that we're looking for. And so we're kind of always doing it. We're always looking at what, what can we improve? What, what needs to change? Um, or what do we just need to, you know, execute better? (laughs) Um, so yeah, I mean, the answer is like, we're always doing it. Yeah. And you have this third location now, we are excited to hear about this acquisition. It sounds like behind the scenes, we were talking, it's an existing salon. You saw an opportunity. What did you see as the opportunity where you could step in and this could become a Devontae salon? So uh, just a couple of months ago, um, and it really was kind of one of those things again that just rolled rolled past. And I'm a big believer. I do know you need to plan, you need to set goals, and you need to have a, a strategy and a structure. But you also need to have your eyes open and be looking for opportunities as they come by, and not be afraid to take those. Right. So we had there was another Aveda salon that was just less than five miles from us. And uh, one day, Melody and Kippen and I were just brainstorming some growth strategies. And I was just like, in the back of my mind, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to reach out to that owner. Because I had heard a few years ago that, you know, he was, you know, maybe, you know, it wasn't panning out like he wanted to. He didn't work. He was like me. He didn't work in the business. He just worked on the business. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, what are the odds that you'd be interested in selling your salon? And his response was, when do you want to close the deal? 
Wow. Yeah. So uh, we, he sent me over, you know, you, I did my due diligence, you know, sent me over the, the financials, went and looked at the space and everything, but he was so eager to move on that it literally was a deal that I couldn't refuse. And so, of course, because I knew all the work was going to fall on Melody and our education director, you know, uh, that I conferred with them and told them, you know, what the offer was. And they agreed. It was a deal that was too good for us to refuse. And so I closed uh, May 1st on that business. Congratulations. You're welcome. That is a very big step. So I know that you don't go into this without analyzing. <laughs> right. Or, so what are some of the decisions that you needed to make in order to say this is going to be a good fit for us? Are you keeping the team? Are there qualifications that this is the right team culture or fit? How, I mean, of course, you're going to have to implement all of your you know, different systems and processes, how you do things. Um, what do you take into consideration in all of those areas of business to make sure that this truly becomes part of Devante's brand and it operates the same? So the first thing, of course, that I considered was, you know, did a pretty deep dive into the their financials for the last three years. I wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, again, like when I bought uh, Devante the first time, that it was at least proving that it could run on its own and be somewhat profitable, right? And and I could see in their financials, they had the same challenges that, you know, we had, you know, since 2020 and 2021. But it, but it did look solid from that perspective. Uh, the fact that it was in very close proximity to us was also, you know, very appealing because it's not that Melody's going to be driving, you know, an hour and a half or two to get over to that location if she needed to. Uh, there was also a person in the business that was acting as a, I'd call it like a producing manager who was, so we already had somebody over there that we thought, okay, this is going to be our focal point. And so that, that was, uh, you know, pretty much it, you know, just, you know, digging into the financials. Uh, you are absolutely right. You know, now that we have been in there one week, uh, there are some things that we see that we're going to be able to help them do better. You know, that that's our whole goal. We believe that all of our systems and all of our processes, they just make work better. They make work more fun. They make work more structured. They make work less stressful, you know, but our philosophy here, you know, going back to that whole change management approach is we're not going to do anything right up front. The, the first question the team had when we announced the sale was, well, what's going to change? And I could honestly see say, nothing right now, unless you tell us something needs to be changed immediately. Mm -hmm. We're going to come in and we're going to see how, see how it runs. You know, uh, there will be some changes that, that are made, but they'll be for their benefit after we've had time to get their buy-in and create a desire for them on how things need, need to be done a little bit different for them. I think that was key right here. I'm actually taking notes this whole time. And I feel like uh, most people come in and they're so excited about their own brand <laughs> that they want to get the team excited right away, get the buy-in right away, make all the changes right away. And for most stylists, especially their personalities being on a disc, let's say is more of an S they're more supportive. They're steady. Change is hard. Change is mm -hmm. daunting. And for a lot of people, change is traumatic. So I really love that you said nothing's going to change unless you all tell us something needs to change. Wow. That's going to be powerful of giving you the insight on what they love and what they don't think is working well. So good for you for seeing that. That must be the change management uh, in you, <laughs> you know, yeah. director in you. Um, so I, I was going to ask, you know, for 2022, what major goals do you have? But you've already accomplished so much. Is there possibly anything yet this year, <laughs> you know, in the final stretch of the year that you feel like you still have kind of as a goal in front of you? Melody, why don't you talk about the work that we're doing to make sure that we become better at executing what we, our strategy. So. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in all of this, anytime that, you know, we, uh, we, here's the deal. We've got great idea generators around us all the time. And that's our people, our managers, you know, our customers, all of these people give us all of these really, really great ideas. And in excitement, 
you know, in wanting to do the next best thing, we're like, okay, well, here's a great idea. Here's how we can just throw it at the wall. And a lot of times it doesn't stick, right? It falls immediately to the floor. It's one of those things where well, didn't we decide to do that? And, you know, when did we decide that we weren't going to do it? Well, we didn't really have a great execution strategy. And so we, we recognize that there's always an opportunity for growth within that area. And so we've partnered up with um, Cunity and their Cunity in Action program. And we've got ourselves an, an amazing uh, coach who is um, dedicated to us um, and, and helping us become better executors of all of these great ideas that we have. Um, you know, cause I, we do a great job, but we feel like we can always get better, um, and make sure that we are using our time as best, um, as best we can and then being really effective with how we use that time. So that's what we're doing. We're using the summer to, to, um, get better at that and, and make sure that we have, um, a really great structure for plan and we plan quarterly. So we are, we've, we've really gotten good at, at deciding, you know, in advance what's going to happen, you know, coming up in this next quarter and, um, and, and being really, really clear about the buckets that things are in and who is going to be responsible for making sure that we see success within those initiatives. And, um, yeah, so I mean, we're coming up on the end of the year. So just like everybody else, we want to have an incredibly successful holiday season. And, um, you know, North Texas, we've got a lot of colleges around us. So we're getting ready for back to school. And so luckily we have a great new partner for new guest recruitment that we're super excited about and, uh, it would meet your stylist. And so, yeah, we're, we're excited to kind of, um, see what's next and, and hopefully do it really well. I love it. Well, and Katie, I guess I'll, yeah. I'll just add something real quick there. I remember I kind of had this little epiphany, you know, earlier this year, like Melody said, we were really good idea generators, but it seemed like we were always pivoting. And it hit me one day that we were pivoting, 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 pivoting. And you do that fast enough and enough times, then really what you are, you're spinning. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where we had gotten into this spinning mode. And so we we're like, okay, we need to stop spinning and go back to pivoting with intention, you know, yep. based on a strategy. And so this, that's probably to me, that's the biggest thing we've done this year. We've got a very well-defined budget we've got that supports our strategy until the owner decides to buy a third location. Right. Kind of, yeah. you know, <laughs> so we've got a very, uh, very well-defined uh, strategy, the budget to align to the strategy, and we're training our leadership team to execute on that strategy. Yeah. I love you both. And I know that you just have your act together in such a great way. And it's been awesome talking with you. Uh, and I can't wait to see all the growth that you continue will continue to have. And now that we get to work together on a regular, it's pretty fun too um, with meet your stylist, but before we're done, I want to ask any kind of final words of wisdom. There's so much that we covered. I took a lot of notes today. What would be just something encouraging or just really good insight that you'd want owners to take away from this and, and go and be able to apply it right away to their companies? The first thing that comes to my mind is that I always have always operated on this philosophy that I try to hire people that are smarter than me. Okay, that, that know the business better than me. I'm not threatened by that. And that's, you know, when that, I think that's why Melody and I work so good together. You know, we're kind of like, uh, you know, yin and yang in that, but that I just, she knows this industry a lot better than I could ever dream to, because she's worked in the industry where I, I work more on the business side of it. And so hire the smartest people that you can find and then trust them to do what you've hired them to do. Because if you can't trust them, then they don't need to be working for you, you know? And so that's how, that's my, my words of wisdom, I guess. So good. Melody, how about you? Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for those kind words for sure. But I think, I think my kind of words of wisdom around this whole topic is, is that you're not going to easily find time, right? You have to make time for yourself to work on the business side of things, stay connected to your people because the, the, 
real talk of this is that our people are the ones that are going to drive the change within our business um, and listening to them and making sure that you're staying as connected to them as possible um, is uh, is really what's going to help you catapult your business forward but with people who are um, ready to walk side by side hand in hand with you in that and on that journey so um, I think that's about it yeah so good you ladies are amazing. I hope you've enjoyed your time with us. For everybody listening, I want you to connect with them. We put the link in our show notes to their website and their Instagram. So please, this is what this platform is all about. If you have, if you want to dig deeper into some of the questions that you have about what they're doing with their operations, direct message them, reach out, and let's all stay connected and help each other continue to grow. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thanks for having us. We love you, Katie. Yeah, I love you both. And thank you all for joining us here week after week at Beyond the Technique. We would love it if you would let other people know about Beyond the Technique, where we are here to change the way that you are supported in your business. Until next time, everybody have an awesome day and stay strong.